Coming up, the Brooklyn Nets signed Nerlens Noel to a 10-day contract. What will his role be in the short term? Can it be long term? And what does this move from Sean Marks tell us about Ben Simmons and Dayron Sharp this season and beyond? It's all coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. my friends ah yes my friends it is the locked on nets podcast right here on the locked on podcast network it's your team the brooklyn nets every single day over there you'll find doug nori owner operator dfsr for all your daily fantasy sports rankings from DraftKings to fanduel he's got you covered i'm adam armbrecht breaking down the new york football giants on the one giant podcast and your new jersey devils on the devil's puck luck podcast we thank you for making us your first listen of the day free on all those great platforms and doug The Brooklyn Nets, just like we knew it, after the epic comeback against Boston, they handle business against Charlotte. They're on a two-game winning streak. We knew winning streaks were going to be a part of this season down the stretch. But beyond that, they also went out and at least on a 10-day contract, gave themselves an opportunity to solidify the backup center role behind Nick Claxton, uh, adding a former New York Nick, people probably familiar with the name, Nerlens Noel, been circulating for a while. Looks like that will now be the move for Brooklyn. Yeah, for a lot of Nets fans, this is going to be like so little, so late on terms of the backup <laughs> center, the, the backup center uh, piece that has there's been a certain contingent of fans um, and probably rightfully so to some degree that have been clamoring for this for seemingly forever to have You're another supposed to center do this on when the- we still have Kevin Durant and Kyrie. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I saw that one coming a million miles away. Signing Noel now. Uh, and we'll get to what some of the implications are for, for that or what we think they are for that signing. The signing d- does become official on Monday morning to a 10 day contract. Um, yeah, no, but it, it adds uh, an element to the team. No- Noel adds an element to the team that I know that, uh, you know, certain people have just been clamoring for a shot blocking sort of rim protector drop coverage, obviously kind of guy. So a little bit different, not going to space the floor, not going to do too many things like that, but good on the glass and, and, you know, for a team, we've watched this Nets team be out-rebounded sometimes to a shocking degree <laughs> at, at times during the season and a frustrating degree at times during the season to have them go out and sign a center now who fits very much like the prototypical center archetype is, I'm sure, frustrating for some people who wanted to see this kind of guy added forever, <laughs> right? Yeah. And like basically since they let Andre Drummond go um, in the offseason and never seemed to replace him with any player that they felt comfortable playing a lot. Uh, New Orleans Noel represents, you know, your more traditional kind of center type that has a place in the NBA, although, you know, probably from a ceiling perspective is somewhat limited. And it'll be in there, obviously, set at the top, a backup to Nicholas Claxton. It just gives you, you think, in theory, someone who's defined in their role and defined in expectations about what they're going to give you on a game-to-game basis. I... You know, I find it interesting when you look at him because this is, you go to the fan base, whether with the Stars or in the post-Star era, it was, hey, you know, get a big who maybe can shoot from the perimeter a little bit. That's not Noel, right? Like, this is like more of the same of what they have. Now, it solves the rebounding, solves the problem, but it helps the rebounding issue. It certainly gives you some other ways to go ahead and spell Claxton, not feel like you're going to run him into the ground down the stretch of this season. But this isn't like, This isn't the perfect solve, like in my opinion, because whatever I know we'll we'll talk about the future for Dayron Sharp and Ben Simmons and the update around Simmons and his injury. But whatever Dayron Sharp is is or is not, he's a dude that can go grab boards. You know, as long as you look at his stats, like this guy's a volume rebound getter in a lot of ways. Now, the foul concerns for him have maybe always slowed down what his progress could be. But does this this move the needle for you in this iteration of the team now? Because I immediately start to think about. Well, if he's the backup and he's coming in off the bench, the second unit, you can just think about how it does solidify the ability for a team that we think has some real depth at certain positions 
to say, well, we don't have to worry about the second unit maybe getting beaten up in certain areas that we otherwise would have been. Yeah, look, one of the things that we all, uh, talked about for a long time this season, and you know, I don't think this podcast was as big on the center train as other places were, right? Like this has been a again a prevailing topic among really everybody with the Nets, like this this center position, the backup center position. Uh, I mean, even you know, it took a while for people to come around the Claxton, even as a starter. Uh, like I think we were ahead of the game on that, and maybe we were a little behind on like the need for another guy behind him. I see Noel more. Of what of the kind of guy that we talked about in the in the uh, preseason or the offseason and the preseason and at times during this season is that what they didn't have after Claxton was like an innings eater, right? Like yeah. they had they they really probably needed some kind of innings eater to just get in there and play functional five center minutes. It's not going to fit great with the switching and it's going to look a little bit different. And you know, but it's because you know they want to switch everything and guys that can't do that are are quickly out of these rotations, right? Like, and so that Noel is not going to fit that. But what we have said also before is that the NBA grind of a regular season down low in the blocks, especially when you have to face some of these other bigger bodies is a lot physically. <laughs> and yeah. what it, what happened sort of twofold with the nets this season with, with Claxton that I think, you know, maybe you would have liked to see a guy like Noel show up sooner is that he just played a lot of really highly physical minutes um, mm -hmm. kind of for the first time in his career and because they didn't really have anyone that they trusted behind him. So Nerland's Noel, I think in that way, you know, from a Claxton point of view, provides some like functional relief around just the physicality of the game, um, which is which can be hard against the Joel Beans uh, and guys like that, even like Steven Adams. I know he's hurt right now, but like guys like this down low can be a lot. And, you know, and, you know, when I say innings eaters as a baseball reference, it's like, hey, sometimes you just need to get at like 14 minutes of a big dude standing down there to <laughs> right. kind of take to, to kind of take the lumps and not be a total train wreck. And we'll get to sharp later. But in that way, I think it's more about like preservation around Claxton to some degree, because I th and we've already seen it in the short term, right? Like he's playing less minutes. Um, and I do wonder if like from from a physicality piece that they just kind of desperately needed some guy to get down there and bang bodies. And is it going to be like super plus EV on the basketball stuff? Like probably not, but there's a lot of NBA minutes in a seat in an NBA season. And, and that's a tough part of the job standing down there. Yeah. And coming up here in a second, I'll highlight why I think bringing in Noel specifically as it relates to these other players, Dayron Sharp matters for the rest of the season, but also when it comes to those playoff matchups and a key stat in limited sample size that could actually be incredibly valuable for Brooklyn in the playoffs. All right, before we get to that, if you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and all the calories, I know I'm in this boat. You have to try Built Bar. Built Bar got the protein bar right. That's because they started with the flavors. Everyone, they have the stats to back it up. It's what a lot of these other places forgot is the flavors. Like it's got to taste good. If you want a snack that you're going to go to that's going to be healthy and you want it to stay consistent in your diet, it's got to, the flavors have to be there. And that's what Bill Bar started with churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut, almond. They have just a plethora of different flavors you can choose from. These flavors sound like candy bars, which they are going to taste like, but they're not going to, they're going to give you the healthy aspects of this and not all the junk. That's because they have 130 calories, just four grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein in every Bill Bar. And they're really easy to get. You can go to Walmart. You can go to Sam's Club. You can pick up boxes there. Obviously, you can go to Built.com as well. You get the four boxes, the 13 boxes, whatever you want. If you want to mix and match the flavors there with some smaller numbers, that's great. Try them all out. Cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puffs. Like I said, they figured the flavors out, and they said the stats to back it up. Go in Sam's Club. Go into Walmart, or you can go to Built.com to grab your Built Bar today. Okay, so the, there's two things about uh, Noel's game that I think are beneficial for Brooklyn. One, you mentioned around Dayron Sharp, um, who we'll discuss deeper here in a second, along with Ben Simmons. But um, the the consistency, I think that that's a big part of it, right? There's been games and in matchups where Dayron comes in, and he looks pretty darn good. Offensively nimble, setting some nice screens, even showing a little bit more athleticism than I think we saw initially when he came into the league. But... Then you get the old six minutes, four fouls. And, and that's the part that I think is hard. You can't rely on that. You can't trust, hey, coming into this game, it's you know back-to-back. -back. We're going to give Nicholas Claxton a 20, 25-minute night, and you're going to carry the load. Whoops. Now all of a sudden we're switching to our small ball lineup, something that we have more ability to do now with the depth that we have at certain positions. But it wasn't the game plan coming in. So I think you get that consistency. 
The other big thing that I think you can look at, and this is a very, very, very small sample size in his career, but Noel is a career 65% free throw shooter. And again, at his peak of his powers back in like the 2015, 16 kind of range, he was taking two or three attempts per game. But Dayron Sharp, and we'll talk about Ben Simmons, those guys don't shoot free throws. And Nicholas Claxton has been better, but not great. And we've already seen late in closing sequences, you know, wanting to get him off the floor, maybe avoid some of those issues. I, I think there is some low level playoff buy here around safeguarding of having a player out there that you don't have that worry about the hack a shack or getting into the line and maybe costing you marginal points and extending games if you think you have a chance to win them. And let's just stick inside the regular season. I think that matters over this 10 day contract to see if he can do that consistently. Yeah, for sure. Like we said this at the time when we briefly talked about it was that it seemed like this Noel signing was one sign that like Daron Sharp, at least for now, is kind of like going to be relegated to not playing. Right. Yeah. And like we've seen, we, and that's not a huge surprise, but we've always been sort of high on Dayron's upside and wanting to see him sort of progress as a player. I'm not sure we've really seen it. Like sometimes that can be just, you don't get enough on court time, right? Like he's been available for a lot of Nets games. They've been in a weird situation. He hasn't probably gotten the reps that you would have wanted to have, have gotten at this point. Um, but yeah, if they see themselves as like a winning basketball team or a team that wants to make waves in the playoffs, I, I for sure they don't feel like they can run with Daron here. Like it's right. he's been a total and utter foul machine this year. Like he's averaging six fouls per thirty minutes. Right? right. Like he can't stay. Even if you wanted, even if you had confidence in everything else, you 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 could never be confident that could he actually stay on the floor for long periods of time because he's a total foul box. And yeah. like some of that is confusion about system. Some of that is just over aggressiveness. Like he gets way too aggressive um, on defense and like body control. Like he still lacks some of that. Um, especially in like smaller enclosed situations. And it just hasn't shown the progression there at all. And even like the things that you like that he does, like he's taken some threes. Like every time he gets in there, he seems like he takes a three. He's like 63% from three. I mean, it's on the, no attempts, but like he can, he has made them right. Right. Um, it's just that the other parts of the game just like aren't coming quick enough here. And you're right. I, I think that from a Nerlens Noel standpoint, like, is he going to play? 10 minutes in the play, probably not right but i think they're probably looking at this and say like hey we just need some other option because yeah. with Deron, it's just not it's just not happening and as the matchups get more difficult we probably just need someone with just a little more experience and on court time i mean don't forget don't forget too nerlens noel is like only a few i mean it seems crazy now but he's only a few years and eh, not a few geez i'm old eight years away I mean, he was like a top <laughs> five six draft pick or something like that like he was a really yeah, high yeah. draft pick now the game was different then Right. right. And, you know, big sort of big centers, big shot blocking centers that couldn't stretch the court were, you know, sort of got on their way out, but not all the way there yet. And he had pedigree to him. He's moved around a lot since then because the game has sort of just kind of changed around him. Right. Mm -hmm. And so but from a sharp standpoint, yeah, I agree. Like. Number one of the two things that this shows, one of them is that like it's a clear like Dayron is at least for right now, not part of what we want to do. <laughs> I don't yeah, think. Well and, and so, so the, the quick note on the almost decade that that <laughs> Snowell has been around the NBA. Yeah, I did some terrible math there because I'm like, yeah, 2015. That was like two years ago. You're like, nah, that was nine years or eight years ago. So <laughs> I've been around. I've been around. Um, yeah. The you know defensive ratings when you look through him, you know it progressively got worse for him. Yeah. You know in those first couple of seasons, he was playing in and around a 100, 99, 102, 199. The last couple of years, going back to the Knicks and then Detroit, 104, 108. But inside of the role that you would have him for this team that has a lot of other great defensive pieces around them, it's going to be very much one dimensional, more traditional big in terms of in terms of what you want him to do but in the matchups that you want him to do that in that's it, actually okay the last note before we turn our attention over to ben simmons because there's an injury update and, <laughs> and all kinds of things to discuss with him but uh, when it comes to dayron it, it's funny i apply the same thinking on him that i'm applying to cam thomas to whatever degree or what you think they can be that there's nothing that's happening right now that is going to inspire or deter the Brooklyn Nets from treating these young players however they think is best. Doesn't mean I agree with it. Doesn't mean that if Dayron hasn't been playing as much, he should be crushing it in the G League all year long this season rather than sitting on the bench. But it doesn't change my outlook on Dayron Sharp, right? If anything, it just says, we know what we've lacked. We want to get a little bit marginally better here. And this is a safeguard move. And the last thing you probably want to do 
when you're trying to develop these guys is put them in a spot where, hey, Dayron, you're going to show up in this first round of the playoff series, the Nets stay out of the playing game or make it through it, whatever, and you're basically going to foul out of games within 15 minutes, and it's going to do some damage, like re- legitimate damage to your development. We how we feel about it. You mentioned the, the perimeter shooting. That's something that when I talked with Candace Cooper when he was coming out of college, she said, yes, he can, but don't ask for it now. Like Don't ask for it in the immediate. So I think Dayron has a much longer arc of development, and you don't want to put him into too difficult a spot too early in his career. Yeah, he's still young, so I don't think there's like all. It's a give up situation. No. It's just that. Uh, it's just that. And and look, I think the Nets to some degree have sort of struggled with young players. I've, well, for the, for starters, they haven't had many of them, right? Just because of the nature of how the team <laughs> has been constructed, a lot of the young players have sort of just moved on. They haven't had a wealth of draft picks in recent years, so like there is just not that much when in terms of the young player covered. I mean, it's pretty bare, right? And but wait, not lose that, I think he's going to develop. I think he's going to get there. <laughs> yeah, Rodian Kurix is coming around, come, walking back through the door. But um, so the I I think that to some degree it's like a little chicken or egg. But they just haven't done, they haven't had a ton of young players just because of the way the team has been built. And then the young players they have had, they just haven't had any trust in them at all. And yeah. like I think it's been both things. It's been only sort of break glass in case of emergency with all these guys. We're still seeing it with Cam, even with all those flashes, like. He's having trouble staying on the court now. Um, Sharp has been didn't he's been DMP'd more than he's played for them, you know, for the most part, even with the roster shrinking a little bit and with an open roster spot. And another thing too with Noel, which I we didn't get to at the beginning, is that they just did have a roster spot here. Like after all the trades, they've been sitting, they've been sitting with an open roster spot for a while. Right. And we kind of thought we would see it. I think they were waiting through the buyout season. They were waiting through to make sure like all these other, because they weren't going to like overtax themselves to bring in a guy here. And I think this very much was like, a, Hey, we have the spot. What's the kind of guy we need. We already have a bunch of guards. We are, I mean, we have 3000 wings. Like at, at some point we just do need someone else. So there really was some of this was just like sort of just roster mechanics too. But yeah, yeah just in terms of young guys, they haven't had them and they don't want to play them. And it's like just this this double-edged sword of like that's just kind of where they are as a team. Also a good landing spot for Noel in terms of showcasing what you still can be, right? You're going to get minutes here. Like you maybe could have picked up somewhere else on a playoff-bound team and just been a guy sitting at the end of the bench, et cetera. So it probably matched up that way too. Last note on Noel, just in terms of where he'll be in in this roster, I said at the top there, helping that second unit. You know, I just talked about in the post game, not, I think you said on Twitter, not going to put this one on the old uh, Hall of Fame resume for Seth Curry. And these aren't one to ones, but just how you flex out these rotations. Royce O'Neill has carved out a very specific role for himself. Joe Harris, the, the, the journey that is Joe Harris. If you give him 18 minutes and tell him to stand still and shoot, that can work for you. The value that Noel can bring into the second unit saw Cam Johnson stick in there and be kind of that leader and facilitator in that second unit for big stretches too. I I do like, even in the short term, I like what he provides for them so that you don't end up feeling like with all the depth they have at the wings, it's still a treading water scenario. Or as all time 50, 40, 90 pace that Mikhail Bridges is on, at some point we're going to start saying, well, we're playing this dude 44, 45 minutes a night, right? Like none of these things are one-to-one. But DFS can't run good and bad, hot and cold, night to night, when you ask him to do different things than you originally intended to do. All that kind of stuff, including class. Well, yeah, because well. he's so playing like nice. he's playing backup center. Like Dorian exactly. Finney Smith is the is the backup center right now, and it's one to one. Like his rotation is to come. He cut. He subs out in two minutes in, or excuse me, subs out for two minutes. They run Claxton, the lineups with Royce, and then they take Claxton out and put Dorian Finney Smith in. Like he's the yeah. backup center right now. And, and, so, and that tax on the offensive end, what you're asking him to do defensively, I, I think yeah. you'll see a, you'll see a nice big shift for him, which will be better value for this team down the stretch as well. All right. We're going to get into Ben Simmons here in a second. Cause I think there's down chain uh, implications for what this means for old friend, Ben Simmons. We'll get to that in a second. First, going to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. Mid, uh, past, well past the midway point of the NBA season. It's a perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers are going to get a no-sweat first bet up to a $1,000. Here's what you do. It's bonus bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sports app, Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, very, very easy to use. If you go over right now in the FanDuel Sports app, um, Sportsbook app, you're going to see the Nets are actually – they have title odds right now. It's plus 16,000. Okay. Oh. So it's going to – now now imagine what happens 
with a little cheddar on a plus 16,000 and they just run the table. I mean, like after the game against the Hornets, it could happen. It could happen. I said Mikhail Bridges should be like a fourth in MVP odds at this point with the way the way he's playing. Is they're not going to put him there? No, you cowards. But this is just some of what you're going to get over on the FanDuel sports book app. Got to get into that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. You go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, friends. Welcome back into the Locked On Nets podcast, Ben Simmons Watch. It's a journey and it lasts a lifetime. Um, I mean, is it a journey? Like, 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 is that the right word? (laughs) Drifting through the air as you've fallen off a cliff and just waiting for the ground to meet you, that's a journey. It's not the ideal journey, but it is one that you're taking. Um, Before the the game against the uh, Charlotte Hornets, inflammation, waiting, reevaluating out. Uh, I'll I'll ask you directly before we even discuss the impact of bringing in Noel, because I think it's, yes, it's a safeguard move, but... we know the Nets are always overly cautious when it comes to injuries. And also, this just, it does feel like this is, hey, man, we'll always find something that indicates why you're not available. There's under 18, like, there's 18 games left in the season. Like, we can stop dreaming on it. And if the Nets are talking about wanting to be competitive down the stretch of the season and into the playoffs, there's no world. Just think about a normal guy coming off of injury. It's just, it's very unlikely that this guy is coming back. I think it's some percentage of, injury and what he's been dealing with all year and the Nets saying we made this big trade you were a part of something completely different here we need not worry about what you are right now yeah I don't think there's tons of hope that he comes back here I'm not even sure it makes sense to push the push the issue honestly like with the way you know, the season is gone and and if, and if it's injury or whatever go ahead and I have a few, yeah go ahead there's a highlight I forgot that he played I can't remember which uh against the Bulls there was the highlight where he had the inbounds pass to Mikhail Bridges from under the Nets basket all the way down to the foul line on a rope, and Bridges put it in. And I was like, oh, that's right. He did play once with these guys. And it's like that little flash when you see the highlight go, you go, oh, that'd be nice to have. But but again, there's just no there's no world where you can think that it's possible. No, and again, like, I don't know. It's kind of like the for what situation, right? Like for what? And like, they're not going anywhere. I I think we've already hit the nadir with his value and sort of just like the sentiment around him. I I don't see many ways where it really improves. If you think it is actually an injury issue and there's inflammation in this pain, which I mean, not even think it is this, right? Like, why push it? Like, just rehab another six months here and just be done with it. Because I just don't know what. I just don't know what the point is. And honestly, when they, when, you know, you and I talked about it off the air, but uh, the day that it happened with, with Nerlens is that that to me signaled again, that he wasn't coming back because like, I know he's not the center, but they wanted to run him small ball five at times too. And yeah. he's de- like, he's not a guy that can play with a guy like Nerlens Noel. Like the fit is already weird with anybody who can't space and oh, Noel yeah, doesn't really space point. at all. Yep. So it's not like, you know, with a floor spacer or whatever, like with Claxton, you're like, okay, we'll get away with it in the defense. They can switch one through five and we'll just be like kind of okay on the defensive end with Noel, like the traditional centerpiece, like you can't play him with Simmons. So the, the part where they signed Nerlens and felt okay about it, even on a 10 day, I thought to me signaled too, like he's not, they don't expect him really to be back here. And if he, and if they do expect him back, he's not playing because that functionally just removes two guys that can play together at all. <laughs> and right. cause they just can't, they can't, they can't play together. So, um, you know, is it like a huge macro, you know, way to look at this? I, I, I actually don't. I, the reason we're talking about it last is I actually don't think it's that much of news. Like, I don't think he's coming yeah. back. Right. And and I don't think they should bring him back. And I think the signing Noel is like, hey, he was going to kind of play some, you know, seven minutes a game and our best scenario of small ball five. But that's just not happening. Like that's right, DFS right. now. And then we'll play him. We'll play Nerlens Noel because we know we never have to pair him with the other guys. And I. It sucks with Simmons. I, I I really wish it wasn't the case. I, I hope he gets better. Um, I just don't know why you would push it for this season. Yeah, and that's I I think too. You mentioned about you know the Nets are coming off winning two games. They have they'll have Houston on Tuesday night. That's great. And then they go. That, that's the start of a five game road trip with a lot of big tests. It's a difficult schedule for the Nets. But I also think too, even beyond the wins and losses, when you see games where Mikhail is playing well, when when guys are operating good in the starting unit together, when the second unit is shaping itself a little bit. That's the that's one of the biggest humps with bringing back anybody, let alone Ben Simmons, who's been inconsistent at best this season, is you're going to insert a guy that may actually end up messing up the game for other people, right, with his deficiencies well, and with – go ahead. 
Well, I, I'll, one thing I will say to that, I, I, I agree with you on one hand standpoint, but I also am of the mind that like the Nets aren't going anywhere this year. And so like no, nowhere of significance. Mm. And so, and you still have Simmons on the roster here for multiple seasons. So I wouldn't bring him back, not bring him back from a team, ke- like from a, I wouldn't not bring him back from a team chemistry standpoint. I would like, I wouldn't worry about that part. Right. Like I would, I want him to rehab and look and be, feel very comfortable. But yes. like in ter- I, I think I disagree with you there. I, I, if it messed up the team, actually, I don't think that would, I would care about that that much. Um, well, okay. Make sense. Would, would I personally, so if he was healthy and it was just getting this, you know, getting guys together, getting them to get some work together in real game action. Great. And I agree with you in the grand scheme of things, Brooklyn Nets first round loss, you know, be scrappy, whatever we think the goal is going to be. That's okay. But in through the prism of what the Nets are telling us, they can't afford to put Ben Simmons out there for games potentially. Yeah, where those sequences happen at the top of the arc, where the offense becomes stagnated, especially when you see a team that looks like what they're trying to build is this is a full team process, right? We don't have the superstars isolated, even with Mikhail Bridges now. So that, yeah, that's the difference to me. If I thought that he was healthy and you can get 18 games of building chemistry with these guys, of course. And I, I I think I said it on the post game because I I loosely noted it at what was going on with Simmons was that I, I love the idea of, Hey, get healthy. And guess what? Let's have an old whole off season because you're under contract to work with these guys, to build something up. And then all of a sudden, we'll be back here, start of next season, saying, is he healthy, ready to play? How does he look? And I think this conversation, I I hate to be tragic for Nets fans, like we'll have this all the way probably until the next trade deadline around what he is or isn't. Is there value there? And can the Nets either keep him, use him, be happy with him, or get to a point where they can move him knowing what the numbers are and the fit with this team? Oh yeah, for sure. Like this story is going nowhere. Again, this guy's under contract for multiple seasons at a huge number. Um, so this is going to be a story that we talk about. I like in some ways we haven't talked about it enough. I, I think just because the yeah. again based on like the 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 the, uh, the prohibitive nature of the contract and everything else, like it's actually probably at some point should be a bigger story. I just think that we're just so far it's been so long with this now that I just think it's like, well, we're just kind of again, waiting to see what happens more than anything else. And, and you're, I totally agree with you Uh, in terms of the off season. uh, This will be one of the main stories probably is like the, the health and recovery. And, you know, is he back on track? And Hey, I, again, no one wants this guy to be good more than us. It's like, it's, he makes the team better. If he's the old version of it, that's just like a very simple math. And don't forget, uh, uh, you know, Cam Johnson extension, Dinwiddie under contract could be moved, yeah. whatever. Like the financials, they cleared a lot of money and luxury tax, is- tax issues. And then it's off season, though, they're going to be right back committed into that fold there. So there's going to be a lot of things to break down and it'll be, hey, we'll never not have something to talk about in a Brooklyn Nets off season. All right, we'll be back after the Houston game on Tuesday evening, going live after that one. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe where you listen to YouTube as well. Appreciate everyone that's jumped on uh, both of those places. Numbers continue to climb. Just really, really awesome to see. So make sure you subscribe in the podcast. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Hey, listen, you're buying stocks on these players. Wait for the price to come to your desired level and then buy it. If it goes down further, Buy even more. Maybe some people are thinking about that when it comes to Ben Simmons this offseason. That's Warren Buffet. Oh, the Oracle of Omaha. We will be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.